Hello everyone and welcome to Box Office Receipts. I'm your host Tyler Callahan and the news has not stopped. Coming in from Hollywood as we have all of that to discuss, as well as regular numbers to look at. Let's start with those. Staying in first place again is Spider-Man No Way Home with 33 million for a total of 668.7 million. In second place was Sing 2 with 11.9 million for a total of 109 million. Opening in third place was the 355 with 4.8 million. Fourth place was the King's Man with 3.27 million for a current total of 25.1 million. Fifth place was American Underdogs with 2.4 million for a total of 18.8 million. Also, to check in on the other films that have now fallen out of the top five, Matrix Resurrections is now at a total of 34.3 million, West Side Story is at 32.1 million, and Nightmare Alley is at 8.7 million. So there were no big shocks this weekend at the box office. Like I said last week, Universal better hope that the 355 got good reviews. It did not get them, and it bombed at the box office. Now this one is a bit odd in financing, in that it got its budget and was produced outside of major studios for $75 million, with Universal buying the domestic rights for the film for $20 million. Obviously, they will take a loss on their investment, but the producers themselves, depending on how dependent they were on getting a cut of the box office revenue, might come out okay. Anyways, really what we are looking forward to here is the first big movie of the year with Scream coming out next weekend. So far, it's getting great reviews, and estimates have it anywhere from 30 to 50 million for its opening weekend, so Spider-Man will finally drop to second place after a month. Taking a look at China, it was a very quiet weekend, and this could be due to the rising cases of COVID in China as more places go into lockdown and people start taking more precautions. Anyway, staying in first place is Embrace again with 11 million, for a total of 112.9 million. Staying in second place is G-Storm with 9 million for a total of 75.7 million. Third place is Another Me with 8.4 million for a total of 50.7 million. Fourth place is Fireflies in the Sun with 4.8 million with a total now of 151.7 million. Lastly in fifth place is B for Busy with 4.1 million for a total of 33. million. $0.1 million. Now you might be wondering, well, Encanto was released, so where is it? Well, it opened in 6th with $3.2 million. Also mentioned a few weeks ago, but the first Indian film in two years to be approved and shown in theaters, called Chichador, also came out this weekend, and it did even worse, coming in at $1.43 million. So depending on how China handles its rising COVID cases, it could put the New Year box office into turmoil, especially if some films get pushed back. Looking at the worldwide box office, Spider-Man No Way Home continues to dominate, making another $64.4 million internationally for a worldwide total of $1.53 billion, surpassing the first Avengers film to become the eighth biggest movie of the world ever. Sing 2 made $17.1 million for a worldwide total of $190.1 million. The Matrix Resurrections made 7.7 million for a new total of 124.5 million worldwide. It does have its release in China this upcoming weekend, but seeing how bad word of mouth has been, I doubt it will do well there. The King's Man made 13.3 million for a worldwide total of 74.3 million. It looks like at this rate it will pass 100 million worldwide, which makes it better than most 20th century films released in 2021. It's still not good though. Finally, Encanto made 5.8 million, bringing its total to 215.5 million. Staying with the box office for a few stories, we first go to Canada, where Cineplex has decided to lay off 5,000 workers for the theaters it has in the Ontario province. Last week, Ontario made the decision to shut down theaters in response to Omicron, and so Cineplex is laying off the staff working the 67 theaters in the area. The company has said that the plan is to rehire the workers when they are allowed to reopen, whenever that will be. 
While that might be nice for the company to say, I still feel bad for all the employees who now have to try and find other jobs or try to fill out paperwork for unemployment. Now we move over to Saudi Arabia, where their box office market has continued to grow. For 2021, the market revenue was $238 million, up from $122 million in 2022. Now, while yes, 2020 did not have a lot of films released due to the pandemic, this is still important as it was only just over four years ago, the kingdom started to allow theaters to open and more and more films to be approved for release. Four films released in 2021, 340 were approved, up from 222 in 2020. As for the market's future, it looks like it's all upside. As development continues, analysis are expecting the market to make 1 billion plus yearly in a few years. This is something studios will keep an eye on as they produce and advertise their films. Moving away from box office news, let's talk about Paramount, where they have actually bought a film, an action thriller called Little Dixie. It's directed by John Swab and stars Frank Grillo. They bought the worldwide rights for an undisclosed amount and plan to release it sometime later in 2022. What's not clear is if this will get a theatrical release, but since Paramount bought it and not the Paramount Plus division, I would think it would. Anyway, unless it's film festival time, not a lot of films are straight up bought, so something I wanted to point out. The Golden Globes had a very subdued event over the weekend where, uh, well, it basically didn't happen. Uh, there was no televised event, and I don't even think there was a party where the winners were announced. Uh, we all found out who won, putting the winners on Twitter. I won't go over every winner, but as a precursor to the Oscars, it's good to get a better idea of what films people are thinking of. The Power of the Dog won Best Drama, while West Side Story won Best Musical or Comedy. Will Smith won Best Actor in a Drama, while Andrew Garfield won for Best Musical or Comedy. Nicole Kidman won Best Actress in a Drama, and Rachel Zagar won for Best Actress in a Musical or Comedy. Best Director went to Jane Captain for The Power of the Dog. So based on this, it seems The Power of the Dog looks to be a strong contender for not only multiple nominations at the Oscars, but maybe even a few wins, and West Side Story will likely get a few nominations, but I don't think it'll win much. Now we take a look at Lionsgate, where they just opened up part of a new studio in Yonkers, New York, right outside New York City. What just opened was 500,000 square feet of office space and three new sound stages, and when construction is finished, they'll be leasing seven of the 11 total being built. As for why a studio in New York? Well, over the past few years, filming in the state has grown dramatically. It's not just filming in New York City itself, but filming for at least TV shows has increased in surrounding counties like Rockland and Westchester, and even filming in the state's capital, Albany. It would make sense to build some proper sound stages for other filming instead of having to fly the cast to Atlanta or LA to get those done. Like last week, we got a lot of news on VOD Premium, so let's start with the simple stuff. If you have been waiting to watch House of Gucci, it'll be available to buy digitally on February 1st, a bit of a more traditional wait since it's released in theaters back in November. Now to HBO Max, where we got a trailer for one of the films being released exclusively on the platform called Kimmy. It is a thriller directed by Steven Sarabo and stars Zoe Kravitz. The film is being produced by both HBO Max and New Line Cinema and will be released on February 10th. Also, another film being made between New Line Cinema and HBO Max is Final Destination 6. News broke this week that John Watts has joined as a producer for the film. Currently, the script is being written for the film by Guy Busick and Laurie Evans-Taylor, and it's based on an idea from Watts. No director or cast has signed on yet. This is a trend I've seen that some studios start to do, which is to either revive a dormant franchise or continue one on their streaming service. And I think it's a good idea, as it helps convince people to subscribe to their service. If this film was a brand new horror movie, it would be a tougher sell as to why people should watch it. But since Final Destination is a familiar horror franchise, people would instantly recognize it. As long as these have proper budgets, I think this is a solid move not just here, but for other studios as well. As for this film, I do find it odd that the script is being written based on an idea Watts had, but only now is he joining as a producer. Maybe he thought he wouldn't have much time in helping out with it, and now he can fit it into his schedule as he starts working on Fantastic Four. Now we go to Netflix, where Deadline has the exclusive on a new film. While it's been known for a while, 
Hollywood has wanted to do a remake, or a reimagining, of the highly acclaimed film The Raid, the pieces are now coming together. Netflix will be producing the film alongside XYZ Films. Uh, for those who will be working on it, Patrick Hughes will direct with Michael Bay as a producer, and the original creator of The Raid, Gareth Evans, on as executive producer. As for the story, it will take place in Philadelphia, where undercover DEA agents try to hunt down a kingpin. I think this can be okay. For Hughes, his work includes Expendables 3 and Hitman's Bodyguard, which are okay films, but nothing special. I just hope for Bay as a producer, he is more hands-off with it, otherwise we will end up with too many explosions. Finally, for the last story, staying with Netflix, Deadline has the exclusive on this, and that is Red Notice looks to be getting not one, but two sequels. Deadline is reporting that Netflix has started early development of Red Notice 2 and 3, with the main cast returning, and Ross and Marshall Thuber coming back to write and direct. The current plan is for the film to be shot back to back, so it would just be one long shoot with a start date sometime in early 2023. I have not watched Red Notice yet, but I'm not surprised that it is getting sequels. Based on Netflix statistics of most hours viewed within a month of release, Red Notice is still number one. Also, doing back to back films could save a bit on the budget and allow the team to write out a story that goes across both films. I would not be surprised if they are able to sign on some other big stars for supporting roles to boost this even further. And that'll be it for this week's episode of Box Office Receipts. Question for the episode is, are you even excited for your Red Notice 2 or 3? Let me know on Facebook. Link to the pages in the show notes. Thank you for listening, and see you next time. <laughs> <laughs>